Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm Paul Glastris. I'm editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly Magazine. Um, we're, a, we're a magazine of politics, policy, and government that's been published out of Washington, D.C. for going on 50 years. And for the last 13 of those years, we've published uh, a, an openly seditious uh, alternative college rankings to U.S. news. Um, instead of rewarding colleges for exclusivity, wealth, and fame, we rate them based on what they're doing for the country and with our tax dollars uh, uh, to encourage social mobility, uh, research, and public service. Uh, go to our website, washingtonmonthly.com, and check out how your alma mater did. Um, I want to thank our partners at New America for hosting what I guarantee is going to be a fascinating discussion. I want to thank the Lumina Foundation for its generous and abiding support for our college issue and, and coverage. Um, the Gates Foundation for its great support. Travis Rendell is, uh, 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 from Gates is with us. Thank you, Travis. Um, also, the Kresge Foundation for supporting our new book, Never Too Late, The Adult Student's Guide to College by the New Press, uh, by Betsy Klein Collins, out January 1st, uh, and available for pre-order right now. So while you've got your phones, go to Amazon. Uh, the title of today's event is Higher Education for Everybody. And it's our attempt to put a label on what we think is a coming wave of reform in higher education. Pressure for this wave uh, is building up from a fundamental tension that exists and has always existed between colleges uh, that were founded and often prefer to serve the select few and the demands of our democracy, that is, the desires of average citizens to be cut in on the deal of higher education and get some of the benefits. We've see, seen waves like this in the past uh, in American history, the creation of the uh, land-grant college system uh, during and after the Civil War, the period uh, in the mid-20th century that saw the GI Bill and the Higher Education Act. Since then, because of changes in the economy, uh, expectations have changed for higher education. A post-secondary credential has gone from being something every American ought to have a right to pursue to something every American needs to pursue just to have a shot at the middle class. Higher education as a sector, however, has been drifting in the opposite direction. We've lavished more money and more attention and dollars on a small number of highly selective schools that increasingly cater to upper middle class families, while the bottom 90% of students struggle to pay tuition, typically at underfunded public uh, institutions or worse, predatory for-profit colleges. Hence the building pressure for reform. You see it in the rising college enrollment rates among low-income students, even as all Americans express frustration at rising costs and student debt. You see it in pleas by business and philanthropic interests for change in the system to help a broader range of Americans receive post-secondary skills and credentials. You see it in calls on the left for free college, on the right in a tax on large university endowments that was part of last year's tax bill, and in support on both sides of the aisle for reform ideas like allowing federal funding for short-term certificates, vocational certificates. Most of all, you see it on the ground when you go looking in innovative new efforts by colleges and universities to create financially sustainable models to cater to citizens who have been either poorly served by our higher education system or ignored more or less altogether, including first-generation students, ethnic uh, and racial minorities, rural whites, and the incarcerated. These under the radar programs, largely unknown even within higher edu education circles, uh, are uh, many of them profiled in the current issue of the Washington Monthly, and I hope you all picked up copies. But they are so impressive and frankly cool 
uh, that I, I think in five years you're going to be reading about them on the front page of the New York Times or hearing them in a presidential State of the Union address. And, and the people who know the most about uh, these new innovative ideas and programs, and in many cases invented them and run them, are here with us today. Uh, so that's, that's why we're here, is to hear from these folks. Um, one of those is our first speaker, Dr. Danette Howard. She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Lumina Foundation. Quick story about Danette, after graduating from Howard University, earning a master's from Harvard and a doctorate at the University of Maryland College Park and serving as Assistant Director of Higher Ed Policy at the Education Trust, uh, sort of the font of a lot of great talent. Kevin had the same position. Dr. Howard was asked by Governor Martin O'Malley, Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, to serve as Cabinet Secretary for Higher Education. Now, if you know anything about Martin O'Malley, he is a big believer in using data to improve public services. And in Danette Howard, he found the perfect person to stir things up. Um, she and her team created the One Step Away program, which helps Maryland colleges and universities identify and reach out to what are known as non-completers. These are students who have earned 75% or more of, of a AA or BA degree, a college, a two-year or four-year degree, but for whatever reason either dropped out or moved on without actually obtaining the degree, and then provide them with, with whatever help they need to re-enroll and get their diplomas. It's a fabulously successful program, and it's been studied and copied by colleges all over the country. Uh, today, uh, uh, at Lumina, uh, Dr. Howard oversees uh, several of the foundation's key strategies to increase America's American's attainment of uh, high quality post-secondary degrees and credentials. Um, she's going to set the stage for this discussion with some framing remarks, so please give Dr. Howard a, a round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. I am um, very excited to be here today. My um, CEO, Jamie Marisotis, usually has the opportunity to be at this event, but I'm really excited that he had another engagement and couldn't be here because that means I get to be here. Well, I thank you for that introduction. Um, what you didn't share is that one of the reasons why I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here is that I am a big fan of this particular edition of Washington Monthly. Uh, some people know that I really love college and university rankings. I have um, been particularly, I won't say fond of them, but maybe I've had a love-hate relationship with them for a long time. Some people might say that I've been obsessed with college and university rankings for quite some time, so much so that about 13 or 14 years ago, I actually decided to write my doctoral dissertation on the influence of college and university rankings on institutional behavior. And when I made that decision, I found that there was actually a term a little known term called institutional isomorphism, say that three times quickly, you can go ahead and try, that describes the influence of college and university rankings on institutional behavior. Unsurprisingly, I found that institutions put strategies in place that are designed for the sole purpose often to help them ascend the rankings. Rankings that were never designed to be the arbiters of institutional quality. Strange, isn't it? These rankings actually incent institutions to become more selective. These institutions increase their admission, stand admission standards. They these institutions be begin to admit and select students that have higher entering test scores. These institutions often shift the balance of their institutional aid to buy, I mean attract and recruit students <laughs> with a more selective entering profile. 
presidential performance evaluations are often based on whether or not the institutional leader will help the institution climb the ranking systems. All the while, institutions move away from their original missions, from the original purpose that they were created for, and moving away from the students that they were intentionally created to serve. Now, of course, this is in all institutions, but when I wrote that dissertation many years ago, I found many, many institutions that were influenced because they wanted to ascend the rankings. And I think you know which rankings I'm speaking about, not the Washington Monthly rankings. Now, the strategies that the institutions put in place to ascend those rankings were also not strategies that had anything to do with increasing student success. They were focused on student inputs, not at all on what the institutions themselves did to facilitate student improvements. This was happening at a time when we actually needed more people to acquire learning beyond high school, exactly as Paul said in his introductory comments. Also happening at a time when today's students are more diverse than they've ever been before. We have nearly 40% of today's students who are older than 25 years old. Nearly 60% of today's students are working at least one, many of these students more than one job, while they're trying to navigate their way through the post-secondary system. Over a quarter of today's students are raising children while they're trying to get those post-secondary credentials that they know are going to make a difference in their lives and in the lives of their families. Nearly half of our students today are financially independent themselves. Do we have a system that's working for those students? Nearly 60% of our students are attending two-year colleges. Only 13% of our students are living on campus. Yet when we at Lumina are speaking to policymakers at both the state and federal levels, we often hear, well, when I went to college, <laughs> or my kids in college, and those students are attending college in very traditional ways. They're attending usually four-year universities, oftentimes more selective institutions, and so the policymakers don't have a frame of reference in terms of what's needed to help the vast majority of learners today make their way through the system and to those credentials that they very desperately want and need. So, yesterday I had the great privilege, privilege of moderating a panel with three of today's students, Jamika, Lauren, and Michael. These aren't necessarily students that institutions are thinking about when they're trying to ascend the traditional college and university ranking systems. Jamika is a single parent. She just earned her associate's degree in January, but it took her six years to do it. And when she got to her final course, or what she thought was going to be her final course, and she went to apply for graduation, they said, oops, we forgot to tell you, you've got one more math course. And then when she went to apply for that math course, she, they said, oops, you ran out of financial aid, Jamika. Sorry. And then there's Lauren. Lauren's a senior now at the University of Michigan, but Lauren is a low-income student at the University of Michigan, where two-thirds of students come from families who are in the top quarter of income, the top, the top quartile of income in the United States. And 50% of undergraduates at the University of Michigan are actually not Michigan residents because the University of Michigan is looking outside of the state to get wealthier students who can pay the full cost of tuition. So Lauren and students like Lauren have actually reclaimed the title of being low-income students because the University of Michigan actually refused to even use the term low-income student. 
The University of Michigan, so Lauren says, issued a guide to help first generation students, which is the term that they use to apply to all students, some of whom were low income. They issued an affordability guide to help low income students make their way through the university. And that, low, that affordability guide had things in it like, well, if you need to save money, fire your maid. If you need to save money, sell your car. Well, for low income students like Lauren, that affordability guide totally rang of tone deafness. So Lauren and her fellow colleagues at the University of Michigan are really doing something about that. And finally, Michael was on my panel. Michael is now the policy director at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in California. But 15 years ago, when Michael was 15 years old, he was sentenced as a juvenile for a murder that he didn't commit. But he was in the back seat of the car when his friend did commit that murder. He received a 15 year to life sentence for that crime. Thankfully, he now works for an organization that overturned his sentence. He received his associate's degree while he was in prison. And upon his release, he earned his bachelor's degree from San Francisco State University this, just this June. I asked Jamika, Lauren, and Michael what they would say if they had the opportunity to speak to a room full of policymakers, which they did yesterday. Jamika said, I would tell them not to think of us as non-traditional students or post-traditional students or 21st century learners. Just call us students and think about what we need to be successful. You don't have to make the case to us that we need credentials. We know that. Just help us get the credentials. Michael said, education equals public safety. Make sure that every individual, regardless of where they're located, even in prisons, have the opportunity to pursue a higher education because these individuals, many of them, will be returning to our communities. And if they can get an opportunity to get an education, they will have a much higher likelihood of being good citizens, being a good citizen. And Lauren said, don't be afraid to identify who your low income students are. Don't be afraid to call them by name. In order to serve them well, you have to acknowledge that they exist. So one of the reasons that Lumina Foundation is so pleased to continue to support the Washington Monthly's rankings is that they remind us that there are institutions out there that are serving all of today's students well. Adult students, lower income students, and now students who've been incarcerated or are currently incarcerated. And so I'm really looking forward to today's conversation where we'll be able to explore more about all of these institutions and the leaders who are paving the way so that we can continue to learn more about the great work that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Danette. Really appreciate it. Um, let me just uh, tell you how this is going to go. I'm going to read the biographies of our, our four speakers. They're going to each come up, give a presentation, then we're going to all come up and, and take your questions. We're very eager to do to get to that part of the program. Um, our first speaker after uh, Danette is Dr. Todd Clear. He's on the faculty of the School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers University, Newark. He has served as the university's provost, interim chancellor, and uh, dean of the School of Criminal Justice and held faculty appointments uh, at uh, SUNY Albany, where he got his PhD, DePaul, Florida State, and John Jay College of Criminal Justice. The author of, or co-author of 12 books and the founding editor of the journal Criminology and Public Policy, Dr. Todd helped found and run the New Jersey STEP program, a fascinating new college program for ex-offenders 
that he'll be discussing today. Ann Kim is uh, a senior fellow and director of domestic and social policy at the Progressive Policy Institute and a contributing editor of the Washington Monthly. Um, uh, and she's been a practicing attorney, having earned a degree from Duke University and held positions at a number of think tanks, including Third Way and on the staff of Congressman Jim Cooper. Um, she's written uh, for The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Politico, The American Interest, Democracy, The Hill, and of course, The Monthly. Uh, she'll be talking about her story, in the, her story in the current issue of The Monthly, entitled An Innovative Fix for Rural Higher Education Deserts. Then Dr. Joseph Nairn is the founding president of Northern Pennsylvania Regional College, which is one of those innovative fixes that Ann wrote about. Uh, he's held administrative posts at Finger Lakes Community College in New York and Rochester Institute of Technology, where he developed a tuition plan for dislocated workers that <clears throat> received national attention. He earned his doctorate at the community college, in, in, in community college policy and administration at uh, University of Maryland College Park. And finally, Kevin Carey, uh, my partner in crime for many years. He is vice president for education policy and knowledge management at New America, where he directs the education program and is the guest editor of the Washington Monthly's annual college guide. Uh, he writes uh, regularly for the Upshot of the New York Times, has written feature articles for Wired, The New, New Republic, Pacific Standard, The Chronicle, of higher education and other publications. Um, he's the author of the book, The End of College, and a feature story in the latest Washington Monthly entitled, Why uh, Colleges Should Treat Students Like Numbers, which he'll be discussing. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, who did I say comes first? <laughs> Dr. Clare. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you to uh, New America and uh, Lumina and the Washington Monthly for doing this work, very important work. I have a PowerPoint that I somehow might get up on that screen, and if it doesn't, uh, I can sit down because it's also my speaking notes. There we go. Great. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, New Jersey Step uh, and Mountain View, which are an in-prison and on-campus. Uh, education program for um, people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. But then I'm going to talk about that area of uh, initiatives that, uh, and the, the opportunities that, uh, that are there. Let me see if this is right. So, yes. So, a New Jersey Step uh, is, uh, is a, is a, uh, has an in-prison program which uh, uh, has an, uh, an AA degree that is uh, operate, operated by um, actually the college that has the number eight ranking in the in the monthly rank, uh, um, uh, the uh, Washington monthly rankings that just came out, uh, Raritan Valley Community College, um, and then we have a Bachelor of Arts program in Justice Studies that's operated by Rutgers University. That partnership is, turns out to be an important way to make this work financially feasible. What's important about the way that we do the work is that every class we offer is a class that uh, that counts towards somebody's degree. So there are lots of college programs out there now that offer courses that whoever's interested in teaching can teach. But whether those courses end up counting toward a degree when a person leaves prison is an open question. Um, we also have an infrastructure that enables our students, when they are released from prison, to transfer to community colleges and to Rutgers University. In fact, when a student is incarcerated and moves from the AA to the BA degree, they're automatically accepted as Rutgers University students while they're inside. Um, and that the um, the uh, in-prison outcomes that we've accomplished, by the way, I, I recognize I'm doing about a 30-minute talk in 10 minutes, so it's cruel to make me do that, but I'll do it anyway. So the, uh, in, some of the in-prison uh, uh, outcomes so far, since 2012, we've served over 1,500 students. That's in a prison system with 20,000 uh, people serving time. Um, the, we offer the AA major in seven of the nine institutions in the state of New Jersey, the far south institutions we haven't uh, started serving yet. Um, we have 500 cur current students, and we offer about 200 classes in each academic year in three terms, uh, fall, spring, and summer terms. Uh, in the, uh, we gave 150 AA degrees since 2012, and, um, and we have, currently have 70 inside BA students 
and we will give our first 15 degrees this year to the BA in, in, in the three BA institutions that we are serving. Uh, our on-campus program is called Mountain View, it's, uh, and it's talked about in the, in the issue, uh, and you'll read about some of our students in some of these data. Um, we have Mountain View communities operating on three campuses. We call them communities because they're really uh, sets of uh, individuals who have had criminal justice experience and then come to Rutgers University to study. And also connected to those uh, communities are faculty members and advisors who volunteer their time to work with those students. We've, we have accepted since uh, 2008 more than 145 students who were released from prison who took a college course in prison under this consortium and are now studying at Rutgers University. Uh, currently we have 54 students enrolled on, on one of those three campuses going to school full-time, taking classes with everybody else. Our retention state, state rate and our GPA, undergraduate GPA for those students who come into the Mountain View program are roughly speaking the equivalent to everybody else on campus. As an aside, their disciplinary report rate is lower than the incoming uh, classes of students. Um, we have had 58 students receive a BA. Eight of our students have gone on to get master's degrees in various places, including Rutgers University. Um, so we think that this kind of program in a very small number of years has has, uh, has, has blossomed to show what can be done when a state university partners with a community college to, to, do, to serve students who are incarcerated and then serve the, continue to serve them after they are released from prison. But I want to talk to you now about the general idea of college and prison and why it's such an important uh, area for us to, to uh, invest in. Um, as a former provost, I want to say, first and foremost, this is a population of students who are untapped. <laughs> so the number of graduating seniors in America is declining. The sets of colleges in America are competing for a smaller pool of students. There are 1.6 million people in prison. We estimate in New Jersey at least 5% are college ready. If that's true, that's uh, 80,000 students in, uh, who, who are, could be uh, uh, part of a college system right now in, this, in the prison system um, of the United States. And the impact that you have is pretty substantial. There are studies that show, obviously, lo very low recidivism rates, high uh, employment rates, high family uh, uh, um, constitution rates. Students go back and, and continue to live and raise their kids. But even more importantly, the marginal impact is, is just amazing. So you look at the difference, not of what these students do compared to other college students, because they do very well compared to other students, but what they do compared to what would have happened if they had not gone to college. And that is the amazing that is the amazing story here. The kinds of life trajectory changes that happen with students who are exposed to college when they're incarcerated and continue in college when they are released is simply jaw-dropping. You will not find a more an impactful experience than talking to one of our students about how going to college changed their lives. We also have a number of successful models of engagement in, uh, around the country. There are probably half a dozen different ba major ways of doing this work. STEP is, is one of them. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking a little bit about why this work is not only financially feasible, but also potentially profitable. Um, so to make this, by the way, I became dangerous when I became a provost because I started looking at university budgets. And you should never let a college professor look at a, at a university budget. Um, so, so one of the secrets here is to cost the in-prison programs at their true cost rate. So uh, at a university, when you, uh, when you do look at your cost factors, you have uh, cost of classrooms, cost of dormitories, cost of football teams, cost of, in some cases, bad football teams. Um, that's supposed to be an inside joke. And um, uh, for a Big Ten university, anyway, I won't say anymore. So, and, and the point is, all of those costs are borne by students on campus, but none of them, none of those costs are borne by students who are incarcerated. The classroom is paid for by the Department of Corrections. The housing is paid for, if you want to use that metaphor, by the Department of Corrections. So the point is that a lot of the costs that go into a college's budget for producing a class don't apply to these students. In fact, if my math is correct, roughly, roughly half. Uh, at Rutgers University, the students don't even use the, the in, our incarcerated students don't even use the library. So, so even the library costs aren't a part of the factor. Two years institutions, as your partners giving the first two years of classes toward the AA degree, have a much lower cost factor than universities, and they can generally cut, speaking cover all of their costs through regular Pell dollars. And, and there's no gap in the in the cost of attendance and the and the and the amount Pell allows them to get. And then and if the four year institutions use a discounted cost, the actual cost of providing the services rather than the cost to an on campus student, turns out that those classes inside are also much more affordable. And then here's the secret. 
if you can get those students who take some classes in college to come to your institution, when they come to your institution, they pay full tuition. And these are students who are now paying tuition that they, these are students you are having on campus paying you tuition that would not have been on your campus paying tuition if you hadn't offered those courses in prison. They'd be doing something else, but they would not be students. And they pay the full cost to everybody else. Now they get a package, you know, they get loans, they get Pell, they do college work study, they get some, they get merit tuition. But the point is, from a university standpoint, that is all marginal increases in your, in your balance rate. And so the administrative portion of your in-college uh, program pays for the cost uh, of your, uh, your on-campus program, ends up paying for the cost of running the in-college program. Let me just give you an example of how the basic financials work. These are not real numbers. These are, I made up these numbers. They're not that far from the Rutgers numbers, but, the, but I didn't want to use Rutgers numbers because um, I have to go back to the <laughs> university. So, <clears throat> Uh, so if you have in-prison program and you're offering to about 400 students, the Pell cost, uh, the, uh, the uh, Pell rate would, would at about $2,000 a student going to taking six credits would amount to about $800,000 in Pell income of which $400,000, uh, roughly half would be the administrative costs of the program. The rest would go to cost for, pay for teachers and, and books and so forth. Uh, at the in-prison discounted rate, roughly speaking, if you have 80 students taking in, in class, inside prison classes, you would get about $160,000 from Pell. Now, I understand that Pell will pay more than that, but typically speaking, you don't get that much with in incarcerated students with Pell, but you get an average of $2,000 per student. That would give you $160,000 in income, of which $80,000 would be used for administrative uh, um, costs. You have to integrate the, the uh, operation of your program at the four-year institution because, you, uh, because it has a registrar's office and you're doing marginally more registration. It has a financial aid office, there's a marginal increase in financial aid work. But that's all, that infrastructure is already there. You use that existing infrastructure to provide those services. You may end up having, hiring a counselor or two, so you may end up having some marginal staff increases, somebody to run the program, some in-prison counselors to make sure you get the students to be able to come to campus, some advocates for those students on campus, and so on. Let's say that you have a staff of a, that costs you about $800,000, you can do a lot with $800,000 a year. That will give you, um, and then if you, on, you have 60 on-campus students paying about $10,000 in, in tuition, they will generate $600,000 a year, of which, of which $300,000 is administrative costs. And if you add 380 and 400, you get about half. You get about the entire cost of the infrastructure marginal costs. So these numbers actually work. It's not like you have to find some no more money somewhere and buy this program. It's the program if you do it at scale, it pays for itself. And I, I now want to say, I'm, I'll, we can spend more time talking about this. I just got the flash that my time is up. So Pell turns out to be very important, and there's some real issues about Pell, to which we should talk about. You may have to make sure that all classes count toward a degree. If you waste classes, you're actually wasting that money and the students' Pell money. You have to make sure st students transfer to your colleges. You have to model your finances correctly. You have to integrate your programs across the institutions so that you are not adding lots of marginal costs and of course, you have to run this thing at scale because if you do it for only a handful of students, it's all marginal costs and none of it comes back in, in, in the form of income. <sighs> Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Kim from PPI. An enormous privilege to be up here. Um, as Paul mentioned, my topic is rural higher ed. And I want to begin, actually, by telling you about a small town in South Central Virginia called South Boston. It's just about a half an hour away from the North Carolina border. And a quarter century ago, it was a thriving, blue-collar, middle-class town. You know, they had textile manufacturers, J.P. Stevens, Burlington Industries. They had a, a big Russell Stover candy factory that was there. And it was also in the heart of what was then Virginia's tobacco country. Um, used to be the host of the National Tobacco Festival. About 2000, bottom fell out of South Boston. Um, the textile manufacturers shut down. Um, tobacco went away, first to China, South America. The uh, town manager there told me that the region, Halifax County, lost about $100 million in payroll over four years. So you were talking about a wrenching, rapid dislocation, community dropping from middle class to disconnection, over an extremely short period of time. If you go to downtown South Boston today, I talked to one shop owner downtown, and she told me she had done $6 of business in three days. So this is not an uncommon story. 
you know, with automation, globalization, um, these kinds of wrenching dislocations are happening all across America. And South Boston faced a particular handicap because it really had no access to higher education. Um, Virginia, the state of Commonwealth of Virginia, has some of the best universities in the country, but they're maldistributed. You know, they're in Richmond, they're you know, in Northern Virginia, they're in Blacksburg, but this little region of South Central Virginia somehow missed out. Um, just for instance, Longwood University, which is the nearest public university, is an hour's drive in one direction. And the nearest community college, Danville Community College, is an hour's drive in the other direction. And this lack of higher education access didn't matter quite so much, you know, 25 years ago, when the textile factories were going strong and you could make a living harvesting tobacco. But as Dr. Howard mentioned today, um, having a post-secondary education, not having that, can be fatal to the prospects of both individuals and to that community. So as it turns out, you know, South Boston is also not alone, not just in the dislocation it experienced, but in the fact that it is a rural higher education desert. You know, the Urban Institute did an analysis and found that 41 million Americans, that's 17% of Americans, nearly one in five, lives in a rural higher, lives in a higher education desert. Many of these are in rural areas. Now, a higher education desert is defined as being a half an hour away physically from a college, a college, public college or university, or that you only have one community college within that half hour commuting distance. And that also includes three million Americans who are also cut off from broadband internet access as well. So that means they are completely cut off from any educational opportunity, electronic or physical. So what kind of impact does it have to have these many, this many deserts around the country? Well, I think it leads to it's a prime mover in kind of two major inequities that our country is facing today. You know, first is this deprivation of opportunity for rural students. You know, we already know that rural students are less likely not only to go to college but to complete it. You know, for instance, 61% of rural students go on to college after high school versus 67% for suburban students. And in terms of educational attainment, just 20% of rural students ages 25 to 34 have a four-year degree. By comparison, 37% of young people 25 to 34 in urban areas have a four-year degree. And you also have a rising disparity in the amount of um, educational attainment in rural versus urban locales. So just an example, um, from 2000 to 2015, the, the share of college-educated adults uh, rose by seven points in urban areas versus just 4% in rural areas, and that disparity is widening. The second iniquity that this in turn is driving is a vast um, regional inequality, something that the Washington Monthly has tackled over you know, several issues. I, I came across a statistic from the Economic Innovation Group. Um, from 2000 to 2015, there were 6.8 million net jobs created in the country. But 6.5 million of those net jobs were created just in those top 20% of zip codes, mostly urban, very highly educated. In the top 10% of zip codes, 43% of people have a BA or better. When you look at the bottom 10% of zip codes, again, largely rural, just 11% of residents there have a BA. So I think this leads to a policy priority that's pretty urgent, which is that we've got to ensure a universal geographic access to higher education. And that means we need to work toward eradicating these higher education deserts wherever they are. Because so often, these higher education deserts are often opportunity deserts as well. OK, so how do you do that? Um, it's not practical. It's too expensive to establish a new college or a new university you know, in every place in the country that doesn't have one right now. But um, as I talk about in my article, there are a few states that are beginning to experiment some really neat ideas using technology in particular, to come up with innovative delivery models so you can reach these students where they are. Dr. Nairn is going to talk about an amazing model in Pennsylvania, um, but I'm going to come back to South Boston and talk about what's happening in central, South Central Virginia, because it turns out that South Boston may have a happy ending after all. So the state of Virginia very fairly recently created what they call higher education centers, and there's five of them that are in this new, in the South Central region. And what they do, they're not a traditional 
college or university in the, tr in the traditional sense, they provide infrastructure for other accredited institutions to come in. So Longwood University and Danville Community College can offer courses through this physical infrastructure that's provided here. And the second thing that they do is that they are very closely tied to the economic development efforts in the region. So they offer courses that are going to meet the needs of either existing businesses or attract development. Because um, communities can't reinvent themselves until the, without the ability of the people to reinvent themselves. And that's what these higher education centers are trying to do. So the Southern Virginia Higher Education Center, which is in South Boston, is in a refurbished tobacco warehouse. Turns out there are a lot of tobacco warehouses in South Boston, and there's one. It's 100,000 really gleaming square feet, a lot of investment that went into this. They have a welding laboratory. Um, they offer courses in mechatronics and IT. Um, it's new, but you know, having more of these centers, I think, would create two really significant benefits, and we're already seeing that in, in Southern Virginia. You know, first, it's creating economic development opportunity by upskilling the workers around them. So for instance, the Southern Virginia Higher Education Center in 2017 um, put 173 workers into new jobs. And in a community like South Boston, that's a really big deal, actually. They also customize training for local businesses. And another thing they're doing is they provide manufacturing support for some of the new businesses they're trying to attract. So when I took a visit there earlier this year, they were working with a consortium of Virginia wineries because they're trying to get the winery business going in that part of the state. And they are working on developing a recyclable wine barrel with these. So, they, so there's a lot more than just higher education that this new model of higher education can deliver to these communities. But second and most importantly, this new model of education, I think, can really change people's lives one by one. And in the story, I mention a man named Michael Isdale. He's a resident of Martinsville, which is a small town also in this area. And he'd actually gone to the University of Pennsylvania for a couple of years. But work, life, everything, he ended up not finishing. And he moved to Martinsville to help take care of his mother-in-law, who was ill. Um, what he told me was that you know, he had work experience, but he didn't have that credential. So he was working security. You know, he was working, he said, pretty much anything he could find. What changed his life was when he was able to enroll in an accounting class that was offered through another one of the Virginia Higher Education Centers called the New College Institute. Virginia Commonwealth University enabled him to get a blended opportunity for, for a degree in accounting. And then he landed a job as a chief accountant at Hooker Furniture, which is a major employer in Martinsville. And that put him back on a track to upward mobility, middle class life, being able to support his kids. So, I think we owe it to all the other Michael Isdales who are out there to, to create the same kinds of opportunity elsewhere. And we can do that by turning greater attention to this issue of higher education deserts, which I think has not gotten the attention it deserves, and are working to eliminate them. So Joe. Thank you so much, Ann. Um, and Thank you also to Dr. Howard. A lot of what has been discussed already are, <clears throat> are issues that we were addressing in creating the Northern Pennsylvania Regional College and, and where we came from. Um, I also want to say I'm a first generation student myself and so I'm very passionate about the needs of people who just don't have that experience. There's a lot of research out there about how young people or adults fail to complete because of the cultural barriers. It's not just physical, it's not just distance, it's not just financial. It's a matter of fitting in the institution that you're in as well. So I, we, we've talked a bit about educational deserts and I want to show you one. This is where Northern Pennsylvania Regional College is based, in Warren, Pennsylvania. If you take a look at this, and I apologize for the quality of the map, it's from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. You'll see that the, that the clusters are in the east and west and primarily in the south. Coming back to Pennsylvania, I'm a native Pennsylvanian. I'm from Aliquippa in the western part of the state. Um, but I've lived in New York for the last 30 years. Coming back to this region and knowing something about it, I was just shocked to see that we had never addressed the, uh, the issues of affordability and access for people in this region. 
There are some colleges in various places, as you can see. But in some cases, they're not affordable for everyone to, to attend. And as I took this job and moved into the, uh, the presidency, I found that there were two different definitions of access being used as well. Access for many of us means convenience, and that's part of the model I will discuss in a few minutes of the, of the Northern Pennsylvania Regional College business model, is to provide convenience. But for me, coming from the community college I worked at in New York, access also means lowering those barriers to entry. We are a college of opportunity for people who have just a high school diploma or a GED, and so we're we're providing opportunities to, to young people and adults throughout the region that, that wouldn't have chances otherwise. So we've got a big part of Pennsylvania, primarily north of Route 80, if you know the geography of the state. The area that we serve, again, I apologize that the maps aren't better, but these northwestern counties are not served by any community college. There's not a two-year school in the region. And so we've established what we call hubs in strategically placed throughout the region to serve 18 different educational sites. Uh, our base of operations is in Warren, Pennsylvania. There's a site there in Warren. Similar to what goes on in uh, Virginia with their higher ed centers, we have what are called community education centers that are neutral arbiters of, of higher education that can bring in various institutions to offer. <clears throat> what happened over time was that the end of students that were there, if you're basing a section on 20 students being able to come to one place and study together, that doesn't always happen. And as those numbers started to melt, that institutions were pulling out of these centers. There was no longer an opportunity to study somewhere near your, your home. What we do, and I'll, I'll get to this with the next slide of our business model, we are able to aggregate enrollment across our region. We've got students studying in various locations using cloud-based uh, interactive television technology. An instructor might be in, in Erie or Warren, or Meadville, or Cowdersport. It could be in any of the cities teaching students live, but they're connected to others throughout the region in real time. And so it, what we found for us, and there was a lot of research that went into this prior to the, the college sort of coming together, the people in our region needed the discipline of a real-time classroom interaction. Online didn't work for them for two reasons. One is, in many cases, they didn't have the discipline necessary to be able to do that successfully. The other is, as was mentioned earlier, broadband access in our part of the state is not available. Um, personally, I think that the, one of the 21st century policy initiatives ought to be similar to rural electrification in the 30s. We should be talking about rural broadband access in the 21st century. But that's, that's part of the problem we we're trying to solve. And so we've, we've brought education to them, as well as putting them in a, in a situation where they could learn better. They were actually interacting with their faculty. You show up for class, you, you have a chance of being called on, just as if you were in a classroom. You have to have your assignments completed. You have to meet with that professor throughout the course of, the, of, the, of your enrollment. What it doesn't accommodate, what we're moving into right now, is identifying through collaboration and partnerships sites where we would also have laboratory facilities. And so if you sign up for a course that meets Monday and Wednesday, you take your lecture portion then, and you know as you're going in that Friday, that several Fridays during the course of that semester, you may have to go somewhere else to complete your laboratory so that you'd have that hands-on component as well. Um, the, the collaboration is very important. One of the things that is kind of my mantra, my uh, my staff, I'm sure, are tired of hearing me say, we complement, not compete. There are four-year institutions in our region. There are other inst colleges and universities. Our intent is to complement what they do. We're reaching people that they don't reach. We're reaching students that would not get to them otherwise. We're reaching students, in some cases, that they wouldn't consider. Uh, Dr. Howard's comments about selectivity. I am appalled at when our state institutions reject our students in favor of someone coming from somewhere else. 
it's, it's, to me, it's, it's bad policy. But we are providing that opportunity, bringing students into, into classrooms that wouldn't have the chance to get there otherwise. In order to provide the spectrum of services at these various locations, our student success specialists, we've got a staff of people in the field who not only are working with students to advise them, help them figure out financial aid, work through the, the whole process of getting into college, but also can address some of their uh, needs in terms of, I, I'd really like to take classes, but I have a childcare need. I really like to take classes, but I, I have a, I, got elderly parents that somebody needs to look after. So these are folks who can go in and connect them with services that enable them to, to be successful. Um, there's an example of our class delivery. You can see a couple that are in, in action. I'll finish with a story of, of one of our success stories. And I hope you read Ann's article in the, uh, in the Washington Monthly, but Tesla, Tesla Moore, I happened to meet very, um, very serendipitously. <laughs> I sat down with her at one of our completion ceremonies and got talking to her and then she got up and spoke and her story was just incredible. This is a young woman who had started college in the traditional manner, um, became pregnant, was, had a high risk pregnancy, couldn't stay in school, came home to her small rural Pennsylvania town and start raising her child. Um, she's a single mother of two, two children now, um, was working jobs that were not going anywhere, was recognized that her, uh, her economic opportunities were limited. And she decided, after talking to someone else, I'm gonna go back to school. This opportunity has come to my community. I'm gonna take advantage of it. Uh, she, di she did that. She interviewed for a job with one of the banks. Northwest Bank is based in Warren, Pennsylvania. And just through the process of interviewing, the interviewer, when she said, well, I'm going back to school, said, you know, this is the kind of initiative we like to see, we'll hire you. Uh, she has finished her degree, she's been promoted several times, and she bought a house. I mean, her, she is the kind of, of story that we, we want people to realize it's attainable. It, we were able to bring education to her. We were able to bring it to her at an affordable cost. We're at $185 a credit hour. And before I run out of time, I do want to mention, one of the things about an NPRC education is you're not paying for a climbing wall. You're not paying for a lazy river. You will not be able to go to the vegan bar in the cafeteria and enjoy the treats there. You will not play junior college basketball. I tell students and I've told a lot of groups that I've spoken to, if you're looking for those things, we're a very bad choice. But none of those things in my mind have anything to do with teaching and learning. That's not those are not the things that are part, it may be part of education, but they're not core to education. And so what we're doing is primarily teaching and learning. We have excellent faculty. Uh, we're partnered right now with Gannon University out of, uh, out of Erie. We'll be going independent within the next year, but we are continuing to keep the focus on teaching and learning, student success, and providing people with an affordable and accessible education in their communities. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kevin Carey. I direct the education program here at New America. Again, thanks to all of you for coming, um, <clears throat> and especially thanks to our guests for their excellent presentations. Um, as Paul said, uh, I wrote an article for uh, the College Guide, which I'm sure we have copies of outside for everybody. Um, and it was about the University of South Florida, um, which is in uh, Tampa. And that confused me a little bit to start because Tampa is in the middle of Florida, not the south part of Florida. Um, but as was explained to me, the University of South Florida was actually founded before the invention of air conditioning. And so it was like the southern part of Florida that you could live in. Um, uh, it made sense then. Um, university of South Florida is uh, a very large uh, public research university. Um, it is actually more selective than your typical uh, public university or community college, but like almost any big diverse public institution, um, it has a big challenge when it comes to student retention. Hardly any college uh, admits only students who are most likely to succeed. Um, and so both in terms of their public mission and also their finances, 
Um, nearly all institutions have a vested interest in being better at helping students stay in school and graduate. Um, and you know, if you care to look, there's a pretty long history of academic literature around student retention that um, comes to some, you know, frankly, fairly commonsensical conclusions about the correlation between cert certain kinds of student characteristics and you're likely to graduate. And so we know that first generation students are like broadly speaking less likely to graduate and uh, uh, low income students and various other kinds of non-traditional students. Um, but that kind of information is of limited value, I think, to a, an institution that's trying to really get better at retention. Because if you're the University of South Florida, you enroll tens of thousands of students who are in one of those categories, and they're all really different from one another. Um, their needs are different. Their, their risks are different. Uh, you can't just treat them all as non-traditional and, you know, like give them something extra to read when they uh, enroll and hope that that is going to solve your retention problem. It's not. Um, but fortunately for University of South Florida and increasingly for all universities, um, they live in this new era of uh, digital information that we're in now. And so in addition to all of the information that they gather about students in terms of their grades and their academic work, um, that comes through the enrollment management process, uh, which is increasingly sophisticated in a lot of institutions in terms of um, kind of figuring out uh, where students are before they enter school. Um, the very kind of act of having a presence as a student on a university campus now means you're constantly engaging with all kinds of digital information systems. Um, you know, the university has a learning management system like any university does where you log in and you get your course assignments and maybe you submit work and maybe you uh, get into an online chat room or even watch some videos. Um, you're doing a lot where you're kind of engaging online. Um, and you have a, a student ID card, which is also the card that lets you into your dorm and lets you into the library and where you buy your meals. And all that information is recorded somewhere in the university system, just kind of as a matter of administrative course. Um, and so what the University of South Florida did, and an increasing number of institutions did, was they hired with an outside organization, a, a private uh, organization uh, called Civitas Learning. Um, uh, that engages in uh, what are called uh, predictive analytics, which is a very uh, present phrase in higher education these days. Um, I would really point you to the research of my colleague, uh, Iris Palmer, who's in the back. Hi, Iris. Um, uh, as well as uh, Ernest Iswego, another one of our analysts here in the higher education program. They're really uh, leading the way in terms of understanding predictive analytics. They have a vendor guide that we've published recently. Um, so if you're a college and you're trying to figure out which of these firms to hire, um, please go on our website. There's a lot of great information there about predictive analytics. Um, and so uh, what this process was able to do was to provide very specific and very real-time information to the University of South Florida about which of their students, particularly freshman students, were at risk of dropping out in the kind of crucial, vulnerable first couple of months of school. Um, and it turns out, all, you know, they had all that information, those kind of broad correlative information in the system, and that was helpful, but none of those things mattered nearly as much as what they were learning from what ha students were doing while they were in school. So the most important predictor of whether you were or were not at risk of dropping out was what, was what you were doing. Were you logging onto your classes? Were you going to the library? Were you engaging in these chat rooms? Were you engaging with the university and your peers and your classes? And the less you were engaging, the more likely it was that you weren't going to be there um, very much longer. Um, so this creates this kind of early warning system for institutions. And again, that's very valuable and it's something that, that it's a, a tool that universities have now that they haven't had before. But what I thought was most interesting about University of South Florida was what they did next. Um, because what they realized was that just knowing which students were at risk of dropping out wasn't enough to actually help them not drop out. Because there could be a lot of different reasons why you weren't going to class and you weren't logging on. Um, maybe you were having terrible, terrible problems with uh, your living situation, in which case you essentially had a residential life problem. Um, maybe you were having a really hard time uh, paying the bills. Uh, there was some kind of family financial crisis. You didn't know if you were going to be able to come back for the next semester, and so what you have is a financial aid problem. Um, maybe you signed up for a bunch of classes, and it turned out they were the wrong classes to sign up for. 
and you're really, really struggling and that's an academic advising problem. Um, maybe you're str really struggling with health problems, mental health problems, which is a real uh, risk and a real present factor for many, many college students these days. And so what you have is a health services problem. Um, the issue um, at the University of South Florida, and I think many, many universities, is that the residential life people are over here, and the financial aid people are over here, um, and the academic advising people are over here, and the health services people are over here, and they all work for different people. Um, and so they don't talk to one another. They don't collaborate. They all have their own defined jobs. They work very, very hard. They're very good professionals. But they work on what they work on. They don't work together. So the University of South Florida reorganized all of those um, different departments under one person whose job was Vice President for Student Success, which is a very unusual job title in American higher education. And I think we ought to think about that for a minute. Um, and I think it's possible that uh, 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 more students would be successful if student success was an idea that colleges were administratively organized around. Um, and so in, in part because uh, uh, the vice president of student success had jurisdiction over all of these different people who were wor working very hard to help students, um, every week all of those different uh, people and about 10 other departments of the university sit down um, and look at what the latest numbers say from their predictive analytics dashboard. Because um, it turns out that uh, the symptoms and the cure aren't the same thing. You may know that you have a list of 20 or 30 or 50 people who are probably going to drop out pretty soon if you don't do something. But what you need to do, you need more than an algorithm and more than a computer in order to help them. So what I think is really interesting about the University of South Florida, and I think this is something we're going to see more and more of going forward, is this marriage of technological uh, innovation with the predictive analytics and machine learning and all the great things we can do, and for lack of a better term, um, administrative innovation. Um, so you actually reorganize your, your college or university in a way that you can use technological innovation uh, to its best degree. Um, you know, this, these new data tools are not, um, not something to be used without caution. I think one of the things that Again, my uh, colleagues Iris and Ernest have uh, found in their research is that um, if you don't watch out, you can kind of wander into some um, uh, troublesome territory. A, a, an algorithm um, is not a smart thing. Um, it, you don't want a computer system, for example, running the numbers and determining that, for example, uh, uh, on average students of color are more likely to drop out of organic chemistry and therefore we should advise them not to be doctors. That, that would be a really bad thing to do if you don't pay attention to what the numbers are and bring the human judgment and the human wisdom that career educators bring to running colleges and universities um, to bear on the problem. Uh, finally, I will note, uh, I think there is still one missing piece of this whole, this whole system, even at some place like the University of South Florida, which I think is pretty close to as good as it gets, um, and that is the faculty. Um, it might be a, human, a dorm problem, might be a financial problem, might be a, a mental health problem, might be another kind of problem. Um, it might be that the class isn't good enough. It might be that the student isn't being well taught and that's why they're not doing well. Um, and that's obviously a challenge for anyone whose job it is to uh, manage a college and university. I congratulate both of you. I'm glad I don't have that job. Mm -hmm. It sounds really difficult. Um, but I do think that this is the frontier of organizing higher education um, and using information. We've got to bring the faculty to the table. Um, we have to put these questions of how classes are designed, how they're taught, how they're integrated with one another, how they're sequenced on the table. That is a student retention challenge as well. Um, so with that, thank you so much for our speakers, and I think everyone's going to come um, up to the uh, up now for a group discussion. So everyone, please come on up. So uh, this is a part of the uh, program where you all get to ask questions, but before you get to ask questions, I get to ask questions. Um, but for, first, let me just say we've got a, a really terrific audience here. Um, we've got reporters, we've got people from the House, the Senate, the GAO, the IMF, the Department of Labor, we've got people from ACE and NGA and different trade associations, um, 12, I think, different 
uh, universities are represented both here in the room and, and we've got quite a few people watching online. So I think we're going to get some very good questions. But let me just kind of put to all of you, it's, uh, uh, just kind of ask a question that draws out the similarities on the programs and ideas that you've talked about. Um, one is that in each of these, uh, of these programs, it seems to be a melding of new technology and some market or finance driven imperatives to serve new students. So uh, my question is, is it your sense that this is, that these two things are going to drive more of what you're pioneering? And if so, what is the one thing or two things that would stop that? What are the real barriers to you guys, maybe not you taking it to scale, but your ideas becoming broad in, in America? And anybody can start. Well, so let me, let me start with the uh, uh, students who are incarcerated. Um, and I think that uh, uh, I want to say that at, at Rutgers, um, the decision to do this in a, in a committed way was in no way uh, a market uh, decision. All of the stuff that I'm talking about about money follows an earlier decision on the part of the Rutgers leadership to do this as a part of our mission. And uh, if the money, the money has been tough, actually, in the early years to work through, because if you budget this as a separate item, it, it turns out to be pretty expensive. And uh, so you have to think about it. And, and it's been really years of sort of trying to think that through internally in the university. Uh, I did say something about Pell. I think Pell is a key here. Uh, we are a part of the Pell experiment, which we're, and we can charge our students. We can, we can, we can obtain Pell dollars for our students. Um, it turns out to be not as many Pell dollars as we thought there would be, so that's an interesting part of the story. But I think what would, I, I think uh, more than anything else, what would stop this work, universities around the country are trying to get into this area. And I'm committed to trying to help them do it in a wise way and in a fruitful way. Uh, but one of the things that will stop this is the, the politicization of the population of people who are incarcerated, thinking of them as only cost centers rather than potential investments, places where you can really, really change your world and change their world through education. And so there's bad pandering politics around that population, as the, as the governor of New York State found out. Um, I'm, I'm still turning your question over in my mind a little bit. One of the things that's unique about us, um, at, you, you saw that we're a regional college. We're not a community college, and that is because legislatively we can't call ourselves a community college. We don't have a county sponsor. The nine counties that are served by NPRC are largely so rural and so, so sparsely populated in some cases that a county legislature could not pony up the kind of money necessary to run a community college. And so one of the, one of the things that we are, we're going to struggle with is continuing that support. Where right now we are considered a regular expense of the Commonwealth with preferred status. And as I said, we're still in the transition to independence. We, our Pell and, um, and FIA funds come through our partner being with, with Gannon. But when we get onto our own, we're going to have to budget very carefully and we're going to have to anticipate our expenses. The beauty for us is that we have no infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure. We don't have buildings. I don't own any, any real estate. Uh, if I were to have accepted the real estate I've been offered, I would be a, a land baron. I mean, er, er, the reality in Pennsylvania, and I think it may be true in many other states, is we overbuilt the system. I don't know why nobody's talking about data, data analytics. Nobody looks at birth rates and high school, the number of students in a school district. Every school district has a report card that shows you how many kindergartners there are through 12th grade. And we continue to think that 18-year-olds somehow spring up <laughs> magically. You have to plant 18-year-olds 18 years ago if that's your, if that's your market. Uh, we're not exclusively traditional age students. We're, we're looking a lot at, at adult learners. So I, I think we, the opportunity is still there. The, the, the struggle for us will be on the funding side, making sure that we can make the argument 
you know, to, to, to sustain our model and keep it going. So I want to build a little bit on um, Dr. Nair's point about funding, but also turn your question around a little bit to be more like what could help these kinds of innovations grow. Um, I think part of the challenge here, because we are talking about adult learners for the most part, is finding different ways to finance career and technical education as well as traditional credit bearing is not necessarily practical to go back to a two year, to finish a two year degree or four year degree. But you know, back to Southern Virginia, part of what they're offering are these you know, four month certificate classes in IT or a six month training in welding or you know, X number of months in mechatronics, things that have credentials that have marketable value. And of course, the question is quality, of course, for these credentials. But the traditional Pell Grant may not necessarily be the best way to finance it. In fact, a lot of these programs aren't even eligible right. for Pell. So one way to help finance non-traditional education, quote unquote, for non-traditional students, quote unquote, is to kind of break open college financing and think about new ways. Yeah, Title, title IV has a lot of limitations. And as you said, not everything is qualifies. And when you do get into the workforce side of it, the, the characteristics that you have to have to qualify for that money are, are difficult to overcome. And we have people, uh, very frankly, in the region who don't pursue work because they, they don't have to. And so you sit, tell them, well, you're eligible for this type of funding. Okay, you know, we've, we've got to make it so that people who want that can access it. But the people who want it don't always qualify. Kevin, about, uh, on the predictive analytics stuff, you and I have had this discussion, but I'd like to, you to share it. <clears throat> what, what, what do you see as the future of it? How fast will it spread? How, what's the, is this like really the new big thing in, in higher education? Or do you think it's inherently limited by something? I think it will become a standard part of the administrative toolkit for people who are in charge of running colleges and universities in the future. Um, so I, in that sense, I think it has a lot of, a lot of room to go. I think I'll, I'll, there will be probably much more widespread adoption um, and we'll uh, get better at it and, and learn surprising new things about how you can run an institution that's aware of its students in this way. You know, I mean, I kind of use the little bit of a cheeky phrase like it's time to treat students like numbers and which is always the wrap on big colleges and universities. Well, they just think I'm a number. And my response is, they don't even, they don't even think you're a number. They don't think you're anything. <laughs> you know, you, they don't know you're there. They don't know what's going on. They don't know if you're enrolled. They don't know if you're coming. They don't know if you're going. They just don't know. They're not paying attention. Um, because it's really hard to pay attention to 60,000 people simultaneously. Um, so this provides a level of awareness and a level of timeliness and a level of specificity to understanding students in a, in a a valid statistical way that I think will help institutions. Um, like all that said, um, it's t it doesn't change the financial aid challenge. It doesn't change the health services challenge. It doesn't change the fact that you might be assigned to a roommate who you're not getting along with very well. So I don't think that it'll, you know, I think it, it, it will have a significant effect on the abilities of institutions to be successful, but it won't sort of solve the problem by itself. Yeah, I was going to say, can you get maybe a 50,000 you know, foot uh, view? Because you're at Lumina, you're, you're seeing a lot of programs. A lot of us are looking at you know, our individual ones, but you're seeing a lot. Uh, uh, and it, maybe you can draw a thread through a lot of this. Well, I wanted to make one comment on um, the predictive analytics to see if Kevin agrees or not, and then one comment just generally about the adults. Uh, piece, but in terms of, of the predictive analytics work, which I am um, a big proponent of, um, you added some cautions, and I would just add another that as good as the predictive analytics systems can be, one word of caution is that um, they won't be a silver bullet if an institution doesn't have the general infrastructure in place that can support a predictive analytics system. So you can't overlay a predictive analytics system on top of uh, structure that is just not capable of working a predictive analytic system. Um, we provided some support to a university that just the, the systems weren't capable of connecting or speaking to each other and therefore a predictive analytic system couldn't help because 
the, the institution just wasn't ready for it. So that would just be another caution that I would add to the, the good um, comments that, that Kevin already offered. And to the adults comment, one of the, I think, challenges might be, um, this is something that we see at the state level. Um, right now, many states are still, or state legislators are still focused on um, a six-year graduation cohort rate that looks at first-time, full-time entering students. And many um, institutions aren't rewarded for the incredible work that they are doing for returning adult students who aren't counted in that first-time, full-time cohort rate. And so how can we incentivize more institutions to uh, enroll more adults and to do well by those adults that they are enrolling who might have some college but no credential when people are still fixated on the small um, cohort of students that are coming in as first time, full time. And, and are, are we not getting at some point better data on transfer students, sure. uh, those who are not full time, first time, part time students? And yeah. I, I, I'm confused as to where that is in the process. <laughs> Maybe somebody knows. But will, when we get that, will that be an incentivizing event? For anybody, but I'm take it. I want some other books. Um, in, in other words, you know, we, we run a college guide. We are we like to think that we create incentives for colleges to do the right mm -hmm. thing and disincentives to do the wrong thing. But we're only as good as the data that we have. Mm -hmm. With better data, do you get better incentives to do what Danette just said? I think that there are there's certainly the data available at the state level. Um, the better data are becoming available at the federal level. I do think that it depends on whether or not people want to use the data that are available. It depends on the leadership at both the state and the federal level. So if you have a governor that's going to insist that we are looking at adults, we are trying to incentivize thinking about how states are considering adult affordability, um, ensuring that more adults are getting into and through um, credential programs, but it, it has to start um, with leadership of both institutional leaders and leaders at different levels as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, uh, so you know, we have now, recently at the federal level, we have completion rates for uh, part-time students, where we didn't have them before. We have completion rates for inbound transfer students, so we have a much fuller picture. And for some institutions that serve a lot of non-traditional students, particularly in the two-year sector, it's made an enormous difference just statistically in terms of being able to really fully look at the whole student population and come to some fair judgments, particularly since they also added a couple extra years on the back end. So we can go out to eight years. Um, so we can sort of see the full picture for the first time. Um, you know, that said, um, I think institutions that were the, the, the data we had was about the students who were, broadly speaking, more likely to graduate, right? First time, full time, degree seeking students. So if you were, as an institution were struggling there for whatever reason, um, what we're not seeing is that you were doing way, way better with your part time students or inbound transfer. That's generally not the pattern. So it kind of gets to some of the issues, the fundamental issues that Danette brought up, which is there are just some real needs for investment and capacity in our institutions that serve. Um, particularly diverse students um, that are unaddressed right now. And it's a big challenge at the federal level and at the state and local level. And, and what's our definition of student success? You know, you mentioned the, there's some fairness being applied to the two-year sector now, but as colleges of opportunity, we very often see people who don't need a full degree. That's not what they're there for. They get coursework that enables them to move to a, a better job, be promoted in the job that they're in. They're successful. They came and got what they needed and, and were successful. But we get penalized when those students don't finish because they say, well, that's attrition. You know? Well, not if the person never intended to complete a degree in the first place, but it's a very difficult thing to measure. Yeah, I would say two things. One, um, we can look at post-college outcomes mm -hmm. in the labor market in much more specifically than we could before. So if we're funneling a lot of students in, we're adding value, they're getting better jobs, mm -hmm. we should be able to pick that up using those numbers. And also there's a, there's a credentialing opportunity there, right? Instead of just <laughs> you only get a two-year degree or a four-year degree, um, if we can actually move to more of a competency-based credentialing system, 
um, where people can walk out with it, one, they'll, they'll be in a better position to get a job, and you'll be able to count that as a success when we start, when we're kind of in the accounting business. Yeah, we're very much about stackable credentials. Right. So. Yeah, that's the, the term of art. All right, open it up to the, to the crew here. Um, we've got some uh, uh, microphones, and uh, since, uh, you know, come on up, we'll, we'll uh, start with this gentleman in the second row, if that's okay. And please uh, state your name and your association if you care to. Hi, Steve Crawford, GW Institute of Public Policy. Uh, in listening to this, these inspiring stories about how to uh, promote access and retention and completion and success, uh, I'm thinking in particular about Kevin's uh, statement about the faculty as a possible impediment. And, uh, as a, as a faculty member, and I'm thinking about the conversations going on around town about another part of campus life, and that is rating colleges on their success in their graduates, getting jobs, how much money they earn, loan default rates, et cetera. We all know that. College scorecard will soon be by program, not just by college. And we all think that'll be a major improvement. I think we all think that but that, does, that puts a lot of pressure on the faculty to say, I want students who are going to be good. I don't want to make great efforts to keep marginal students and help them struggle through to completion if they're not likely to be very effective students, go on and get a good job and make my program look good in the ratings that are going on and the comparison shopping that we're trying to make easier with things like Credential Engine. So, my question to the panel and those of you who uh, feel ready to answer it is, how do you deal, how does the faculty deal, how do the systems, it's a collective action problem at, at one level, deal with this tension between trying to look good at the uh, sort of output end and promote access, retention, and completion by students who have traditionally had some, some challenges? Well, I, I'll answer, take a crack at that myself. You know, in the Washington Monthly College Guides, we, we, don't, we, we compare like to like. So uh, we take it into account the demographics of the students a university gets. We compare them to schools that have similar demographics. And if they, on our different measures of earnings and loan payback and, you know, a host of other things, do better than the mean, they get points if they do worse than the mean, they get less points. So in that way, I don't, you know, were the Washington Monthly the ult ult ultimate arbiter of what is good, and I think it should be, but it's not yet, uh, you know, I don't think the faculty would be put at a disadvantage to go out and teach the students who actually come in rather than the ones they want to get. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Alan Sesums. I'm uh, the managing partner of what we call the Higher Education Innovation Group. I've been the president of three universities, including the University of the District of Columbia. And I have two questions. The first one to Kevin. I think data analytics are really important, and they will focus on some of the key issues the students have. But then what do you do with it? Because, for example, most of the institutions don't have the resources to intervene in the mental health space. They don't have the resources to intervene in the residential uh, problem space. So we get the information and we say, okay, what the hell do we do now? And we have to think about whether that becomes a problem for the institutions, in fact. Uh, the second question is on uh, uh, teaching students who are in incarcerated. Back in the day, it was a little known. And when st states started cutting back on uh, funding for education, the matter became, well, why should we educate these malcontents we should, we should be spending money educating the folks who are actually take care of the business. Uh, so those programs went away, and in some cases were legislated away. Uh, how do we deal with that political reality? Um, I mean, on, on the first question, uh, it's, I think you're absolutely right, and I think, I mean, like a broad observation about the way that uh, many colleges and universities are set up administratively is that they're not often designed um, to invest money now um, that pays off in the future, right? And so that's one of the barriers to kind of getting these systems in place is you have to kind of 
get all the data together and you got to put some money on the table. Um, and you know, nonprofit institutions, and I understand this, you know, they're just struggling to kind of like make sure enough money's coming in to pay the bills so you can come back around and do the next thing next year. Particularly a lot of our private nonprofit institutions, which really just kind of run on tuition, but even public institutions that are, you know, uh, under-resourced to start with and have, uh, getting less now from the government than they got, you know, say 10 years ago. So to, in that budget situation, say we got to find even more money right now because we know it's going to pay off in five years and 10 years, that's a hard leadership decision to make. And I think that's a public policy challenge. And I think that as we support our institutions, we need to, uh, you know, give them the capacity to sort of build their own ability to respond, um, whether it's by giving, getting better at using information or getting better at reacting to information, because otherwise you're just kind of stuck on this treadmill um, and you don't make any progress. I, I would want Todd to answer the second part of your question, but I just want to say one thing. One of the things that excited me when it was, in fact, Danette that introduced me to Todd and his program was I remember those days when uh, lawmakers were saying, why should we fund free college for you know, convicts when I have to pay for my kids' education and tap my 401k. What is interesting about this model is that these are, these are full-paying tuition, full-paying students. They're coming with their own dollars. And the universities, as, as Todd explained, and, and they're looking for people. They have fewer and fewer young people coming in, so they're in the market to try something different, try something new, innovate, to bring in those dollars. And so you can see the potential here of, you know, we have, as Todd said, this huge uh, 1.6 million in, uh, population of incarcerated individuals that's going to be drawn down over the next 20 years. And this decline in, in student, uh, potential students. And uh, you can imagine universities seeing the, the New Jersey model and saying, you know, that's, you know, not that there's, you know, we should be driven by buddy, but let us, let us understand that universities, like every institution, need to bring in revenues to, to operate, becoming uh, uh, advocates for prison incarcer you know, in, uh, education in prisons and after prisons. And when you have major institutions at the state level advocating for something like this because it's in their financial interest as, as well as in their moral interest, then I think you can, you know, the politics of this can turn around uh, a lot easier. Well, it's still funded by taxpayers, but it's dependent on Pell. Well, it's dependent on Pell, but so, so is my kid gets Pell. And, and, and it, no, I, I, hey, the politics is tough. It, there, there's no getting get around. But I'd rather have a politics in which universities are advocating for prison programs because it's in their financial interest to do so. And they're the ones wa walking the halls of the state house uh, pressuring uh, uh, legislatures to do this than, than not. So at Rutgers University in Newark, uh, any student in New Jersey who is accepted to Rutgers gets a package put, this is the commitment we make to any, any New Jersey resident, gets a package put together that will enable them to attend. So finances will never be the reason why a person is not coming to Rutgers University in Newark. Um, uh, so that sets the backdrop for an, a conversation about students who are in prison. I'm, and I, I think your point about the politics of this is a good one. Uh, I was giving a public talk a few years ago, a couple of years ago about this uh, work. And somebody said, I'm going to tell my son to go do some burglaries so he can go to, go to college for free in New Jersey. And, I, and in that moment, you know, every once in a while you get the right answer comes to you, you know? And I said, go ahead. You think that's a good deal for your son? Do it. And, it you, and what you could feel in the room was nobody thinks their son should commit a burglary in order to get an education. They want their son to get an education. So we, if you get accepted to Rutgers University of Newark, you will come here and get an education at the 34th best on our rank, in that ranking system, the 34th <laughs> best university in the na nation. So, uh, and, and um, if you are incarcerated, you will use your Pell dollars. You have a lifetime limit on your Pell dollars. This is why we have to make sure that everything you, this is why it's a real I issue for me because if you teach a class to a student in prison and they're using Pell dollars to pay for it and they get out and then they can't use it to get a degree, then you've actually exploited them for your own profit, right? So we have to make sure that what goes on in the prisons 
really does lead, lead to a degree. But they're using their lifetime Pell. They have zero income, or two, you know, 10 cents an hour, income. And so they're using whatever they got to pay. And you're organizing your resources so that you can do that, to give them an education, so that when they come out, they can become students and become contributors to society. Now, if you're opposed to that, then you're opposed to that. But it's hard to understand why you'd want to not to have the other trajectory for those students, where they're, they're not allowed to use their limited Pell eligibility to get in college, and they're not allowed to change the trajectory trajectory of their lives. And when they come back to Newark, New Jersey, we get a thousand people in Newark every year from the prison system in New Jersey. When they come back to Newark, New Jersey, they don't have those choices that we have put them on the line. And if that's what you think is good public policy, then we have a disagreement about good public, public policy. But if your son wants to come to Rutgers University in Newark and gets accepted, we'll make sure they, they have a financial package that enables them to attend. That's what makes the difference. Um, uh, By the way, Chris Christie was the governor when we started this work. <laughs> uh, we can also have, for folks who are watching online, you can, you can uh, send in questions, and Riker's going to tell me how to do that? New At New America on Twitter. <laughs> At New America Ed on Twitter. Thank you. So all of you, feel free to send in your questions. Uh, other questions? This gentleman right here. My name is John. I'm uh, from the National Governors Association. And so it, uh, it shouldn't hopefully come as a surprise that higher education, especially affordability and accessibility, is a, a big issue on the elections that are going to take place in a couple of weeks. So as you know, we support governors um, in a lot of ways as they will be taking their seats, at least 18 new governors, um, just by virtue of folks that are retiring or are term limited will be taking their seats in January. So I'm interested in what practical advice any of you would have on governors looking to either institute or scale any of the programs that you have addressed here today? Wow. I can't, I can't help. I have to because <laughs> this is why I came here, to be able to talk to people like you. So um, every uh, state is trying to reduce its prison population. Uh, there is no program that has been offered to people in, who are incarcerated that has even half the success rate on reducing recidivism of college programs in prison. There, nothing comes close as a recidivism reduction program and alone. I don't think that's the way you'd want to evaluate it, but if that's the way you want to evaluate it, it is there. We now educate 5% of the people who are incarcerated in New Jersey. We think we could at least double that. So there's a large pool out there of people who could benefit from this. And there's a state university in every state. There are community colleges in every state. They have as their mission educating the citizens of that state. The people who are in prison are the citizens of that state. There's a marriage to be made here, and it's straightforward, and it doesn't cost that much. And you, there's, there's some costs getting it started, but once you get it going, it can, it can, it can, uh, it can be at cost or even produce uh, uh, excess revenues. I can. Um, I think one very practical step, at least as far as rural higher ed, is simply just to map where the higher education deserts are in a particular state? I mean, that's a question that we don't even know. The Urban Institute actually has a beautiful map of this, but you know, in your particular state, where is that desert? And then there are clearly resources around the country for people who've set up successful models for how you address that, and different models may work in different communities. But just finding where those deserts are is the first step. One, one thing that I, I just came from the Rural Community College Alliance meeting uh, a month or so ago. One of the things that concerns me, and if I were talking to governors who were looking at the issue and trying to solve it is, do we need to have the same thing in all these places? I'm talking with colleagues who are saying, we need to have residence halls. You have to have athletic teams. <laughs> and, and I'm saying, that's, those are all nice things. You know, I was fortunate enough to go to a four-year residential college, and I refer to it as four years of deferred adulthood. You know, I didn't have to grow up for a long time. But the students that I serve, the people who come to my institution, are very adult in, in a lot of ways. They have families, they have jobs, they have responsibilities. And, you know, I facetiously mentioned the climbing wall and the lazy river earlier, but that, that's a reality. We keep adding these things. And, you know, when my colleagues at, at other two-year institutions start talking about replicating the residential college experience, a red flag goes up for me. I don't think that that is the future. I think what we're doing is disruptive. Uh, I think what NPRC represents is a, 
is a change in the way that we look at higher education and its delivery and the utility of it. Uh, we're very much interested in career and technical education, and yes, we will serve a transfer mission as well. But I don't have to have residence halls. I don't have to have dining halls. I don't have to have athletic teams for our students to be successful in life. Uh, quick anecdote. We interviewed a woman who is the president of a very, very fine, exclusive uh, liberal arts college that does a tremendous job of recruiting and graduating lower income students. And I asked her, you know, what, what are some problems? And she said, well, the higher income students uh, want things that make it tough for us to afford the lower income students. And give me an example. She said, well, they wanted organic zoysia grass. The, the grass on the campus was, they were using chemicals or whatever, we, and so we had to go to an all, I forget what, it, what the, the zoysia grass was, but there was a particular high maintenance zoysia grass that if they didn't provide, the parents and the students would think, eh, I don't think I'll go to the school across the road. So often these lazy rivers and, and so forth, and it's an overused you know, metaphor, but I mean, it, it, it's true that there's lots of this. Uh, it is often driven not by the students who desperately need a sound education, but those that can afford, you know, uh, a lot to get zoysia grass. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Kathleen. Um, I'm from EAB, and this is a question for Anne and Joe. I'm so, sorry, can you speak up just a sorry, little bit? Sorry, is the mic working? Yeah. So I'm Kathleen, I'm from EAB, this is a question for Anne and Joe. So in, that, in these higher ed deserts, how are you facilitating collaboration between institutions to share resources and share space? And two, since internet access is a problem, how are you identifying and reaching the students that are eligible for these programs? Okay, that's all you. <laughs> Anne deferred to me, very good, thank you, <laughs> I think. Um, the, 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 one of my trustees spoke at my inauguration a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that uh, Kate Brock said in, in her remarks was about how much trust had gone into the establishment of the college. And that really is, these partnerships and collaboration really are based on trust and, and from my perspective, mutual respect. That we, you know, I said earlier, complement, not compete. Well, we're going to compete. That's, that's inevitable. But I believe that what we're doing is complementary to the mission of the other institutions. Our mission is very simple. It is to serve the post-secondary needs of the unserved and underserved residents of northern Pennsylvania. So that's a pretty broad. And we can work with others to um, utilize what, what I refer to. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I, I say there's a lot of lazy assets out there. There are institutions that are not using their laboratories in evenings or weekends. There are classrooms that are underutilized. There's space in different um, career and technical centers or community education centers or, or other institutions that we can partner and, and collaborate. There's some revenue coming to the institution for use of those facilities and we haven't taken on the overhead and the infrastructure costs of, of building a lab. Uh, so it, it's, you know, the, I, I hope I'm answering your question, but that, that's the, the approach we've taken is to work with others and recognize win-win is possible. I mean, we don't have to say there's the student and we're going to fight over enrolling them. We can look at the student and say, who serves them best? And maybe long term, we're both, uh, we're both going to see them be well served. And I will say one thing about collaboration is not just within the institutions, but I think these institutions are unique because they also collaborate with the business community and the community around them. Um, I didn't mention that in addition to, you know, um, Pennsylvania and Virginia, Texas has a few of these now. Maryland has higher education centers as well. And another disruptive element of what these, inst these new institutions are bringing to the table is that they are collaborating with the economic development authorities in their region too, so that the coursework is actually narrowly tailored to um, success as is defined by these institutions, which is career success and labor market success, as well as credentialing success. So that collaboration is also proving to be extremely important. I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was remiss in not saying I believe that a big part of our mission is to be 
an engine for economic development in the region, to listen to those employers and work well with them to make sure that we're all moving forward. Yes. Yeah, please. Young lady. Hi, I'm Rachel with the College Board. Um, I have a question about uh, student debt. Um, many prospective students see uh, the potential for accumulating student debt as a barrier to um, seeking higher education. Uh, what opportunities do you see for um, institutions, uh, programs um, to uh, reduce the, the burden of student debt for students who are post-graduation or um, current students? I will just answer anecdotally, one of the things that has been uh, attractive to students about us is that very few students are incurring much debt. The cost of attendance is low. I said we're $185 a credit hour right now, and that's for a regular adult or regular student. We charge $60 a credit hour for uh, dual enrollment students who are in high school because they're not eligible for any sort of aid. We, we keep the price down for them. We've had students graduate with no debt. We're not charging fees. We're not charging, you know, a, very often the problem with college tuition is it's not telling you the whole cost. There's a lot of other expenses that go into that, and especially in the residential experience. We're just charging for courses right now. And so you can predict what your cost is going to be. And the young woman I was talking about earlier, Tesla, graduated with a two-year degree in business, is working, and had no debt. As a, as, because it was affordable. C college with no fees and no debt? How can that be? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. Yeah. And, and I, I would just add that you know, we're trying to get um, states to think differently about how they're supporting um, adults in terms of financial aid. Uh, many statewide financial programs are really targeted toward recent high school completers. And so we're asking uh, states to think about what an adult promise program would look like. Um, what would it look like if you included adults in, in those efforts? Um, we're also asking institutions to think about um, what it would look like if you really expanded prior learning, not just to prior learning assessment, but what if you had stronger partnerships with your employers such that students could get credit for the work that they are doing and all the training that they're getting from their employers if they can demonstrate that they have mastery um, over um, some areas that you actually offer courses for. Can they get credit for that and then move further along um, toward a credential such that they don't have to pay to take those courses mm -hmm. over again? So, that there, so there are ways to think more creatively about making credentials more affordable so that students don't have to take on more debt that they need to. Uh, the gentleman here. Thank you. Um, initially, college, and college credit or college graduation with association? I'll, I'll get there in a second. Okay, great. College credit or graduation with no debt. My undergraduate education cost me $32 a semester in the City University of New York. There are ways that we have done it in the past if we had the will to do it now. Um, my name is Fred Winter. I'm a retiree from the Fund for an Improvement of Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education, um, which in Washington terms means now I'm a consultant. Um, <laughs> Dr. Howard, I'd like to go back to your introduction. You talked about institutional inf um, isomorphism and the way institutions are responding to the ranking surveys that have been published. Do you have hard data on how students are using and responding to the rankings mm. that would complement that? Very interesting. So I didn't look at student behavior, but I, I have a hunch. You didn't ask me about my hunches, so I won't <laughs> respond in that way. But I, I looked at institutional behavior, not student behavior. My sense is that students from more affluent families are um, looking at the US News and World Report rankings and um, perhaps being influenced by them. Certainly, um, parental behaviors being influenced by those rankings. Um, but I don't have hard data on that. Bless you. A little support for, for, for Danette's point is that 
I think the figure is either 70 or 80 percent of students attend, who attend college do so within an hour's drive of their home or something like that. So, so the, 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 the student who's footloose enough to choose a college somewhere other than where they live is, is, is in that 20 percent, and that's, that's, who, that's who we're talking about. Directly correlated with income of the families. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. the upper middle class and wealthy drive a lot in this country, as, as we're learning more and more. Uh, young lady here. Hi, my name is Amy Smith. I work with National Campus Leadership Council. So we have a network of student leaders across the country. Um, so my question is, I guess a little context we're all saying that you know today's universities uh, or institutions or credentialing agencies don't reflect today's students and i would argue my organization would argue that um, maybe we haven't been listening to the students about what they need all along and so with these new innovative um, ideas i'm curious to know how you're going to uh, create infrastructure so that you're consistently listening to student voices and the data analytics piece is very interesting I think but I think coupled with student stories and making sure that you're always going back to the students to understand what they need so that we don't get 50 years from today with today's institutions not reflecting those future students thank you yeah I mean it, it's uh, there's a the, the whole field of trying to get different kinds of information and um, and understand it like we like the explosion of available information is way ahead of our ability both to understand what it means and then to react to what it means um, I mean there are like consulting firms right here in the DC area where all they do and they mostly are working on behalf of corporations is uh, like throw a huge net through the entire world of media and social media and try to figure out what it means for the company's reputation and bottom line and it's all like natural language processing and then they were getting good at that, and now they have to uh, figure out what emojis mean. So, I mean, because, like, for real, it's, it's a non-trivial part of the dialogue. And so they've, you know, they kind of figure these things out. And so, um, you know, I think that can be part of it. Like, I mean, students, students are always uh, engaging and communicating, um, but in a way that's maybe a little more accessible to institutions. There's a kind of a surveillance piece of it that starts to get a little scary when you think about it. Um, so we need to be super careful uh, that we respect student privacy. Um, uh, but it does feel like there are a lot of opportunities to not just assume we know what the students are thinking, but actually to ask them and to see for ourselves. So the students who come to Rutgers <clears throat> from the prison system uh, are, uh, we have a, 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 a prison review board, it's called. <laughs> um, of a faculty and staff who review any applicant who wants to come onto campus from prison and, and go over their, their work, academic work in prison and their readiness for, to be on campus. We've, every student we propose to them has been accepted, so we've never had a no. Now, I, I, I don't know what'll happen when we get a no, but, uh, but, but those 145, that's exactly the number we propose. And um, they come to campus and, and they, are, um, they are expected to join a Mountain View community. That is a community of students <clears throat> who and they will they, uh, uh, in the first year they have a they take their first college class as a unit together uh, and that class studies college success what do we know about college success and uh, then they go into their majors they all get an academic mentor in the Mountain View community and they all get a personal mentor in the academic community and so there's this a lot of peer uh, um, support going on because uh, frankly their community understands more what they're going through than anybody else in the university. But they have direct access to leadership in, in, the, um, uh, in the service areas on, on each of those three campuses. And so I hear a lot about, because we, do, we, we talk with them a lot and we highlight them a lot, there almost never uh, uh, does an issue come out on something that Rutgers is doing that we don't talk about one of those students in one way or another. So we're quite proud of that work. And so there's this way in which they have become a part of what we listen to in, in, uh, doing, in doing our work. Rutgers University has this, um, Newark has a, an honors program that is called, that is for students, not the traditional honors side, but students who have shown great success in overcoming barriers. And, and we admit a handful of students to a residential program there every year, and every year some of those students or people come to us from the prison system. This is perhaps, 
This is perhaps my favorite question because we've, um, we've tried to be more intentional about not having conversations like this about students without having student voices present in the conversation. And I spoke about um, Jamika, who was one of our panelists yesterday, and she said that um, now that she's graduated, her college constantly calls on her to be the voice of students. And so um, they called on her recently and said, you know, we, we heard that there's an issue with um, hunger insecurity. And so, Jamika, how do we find these students who are um, hungry? What do we do? And she said, have a meeting and serve food. Like the students, learn <laughs> <laughs> these you know commonsensical things that administrators seem to just not understand, and and so we're trying to really just be mindful of that. Uh, likewise, we often ask, you know, how can students be more college ready, and we're trying to turn that around and say, how can colleges be more student ready? Um, and so these are just um, these little things that we're trying to constantly remind ourselves not to put the onus on the students, to, but to put the responsibility back on ourselves. Thank you. Which is kind of the opposite of the way the higher education system is set up, <laughs> exactly. right? All yeah. of us who went to college, you know, we were told, hey, sink or swim, it's up to you, you'll make the best of this or you'll fail. And there was just no sense that we were taught or that we got, in terms of feedback, that it was on them to make us succeed. And, you know, that's fine with very well prepared students who are probably going to succeed anyway. It's, it's just, it's insane in a system where, you know, the country sinks or swims by the percentage of our citizens that have a higher education credential. Um, do we have some more questions? And if so, maybe we've only got a couple of minutes, so maybe we can double or triple up the questions. We'll start with this gentleman. Uh, uh, my name is Artem. I'm from Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. My question is, um, these are all good ideas of expanding access and expanding opportunities to more people, but how do you deal with the entrenched culture of meritocracy that sort of has been developed that, that stands in opposition you know, or that stands as a barrier to many of these things? Okay. Do we have uh, any others? Yeah, this lady here. Hi, Janan with uh, American Council on Education. Piggybacking on um, his question is also, how do we think about new ways to evaluate students and programs? Because I think even sitting here today, as much as we might, might not like some other rankings, most of us probably went to some of the institutions listed in the top 20 of those rankings. So um, going with him, these entrenched notions of meritocracy and value, along with how do we incorporate more systems of evaluation that will uh, span the reach of the students we're serving. Mm -hmm. And any more? Okay, let's uh, lightning round of answers from our from our esteemed panel on the evils of meritocracy and new <laughs> models of evaluating students. I guess the answer is go vote. <laughs> um, so the, the, in the last ten years, only two Rutgers students have won um, a. Um, Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, and both of them took their first college course in prison. So, so merit, if you count it right, it's not a problem. And, you know, I would say to your institutions, you'll see a lot of literature that calls us democracies colleges. You know, that they're the open door, the opportunity to, to, to come in. And it's on us, I, I, I think somebody said earlier, it's on us to, make, to help people be successful. An open door can't be a revolving door. It has to be... It has to be one that, that provides support for the student that, that takes the initiative to cross that threshold and, and help them be successful. You guys ought to run for office. You're very good at this. Well, I, I do want to say that we count merit badly because it's my dad has a lot of money and has given a lot of money to the university. Therefore, that's meritocracy. I, that's not meritocracy. We know that. So meritocracy is the students at, at Rutgers who you know, grew up in a single-parent family uh, with parents going in and out of prison, and that student is getting a 4.0 in biology as a biology major. Let's make investments there and make sure those students have everything they need to be able to succeed. Yeah. I just want to say one thing on evaluation. Um, the federal government spends an enormous amount of money subsidizing the cost of higher education and almost nothing studying whether what works in higher education. Um, as generous as the Lumina Foundation and the other foundations are, they can't do it by themselves, and we cannot rely on institutions to voluntarily 
ask tough questions about themselves. So we had a gentleman here from FIPSI, from the Department of Education. Um, if you're out there, you know, if you're, if you're uh, out there in any position to affect uh, federal spending priorities, for relatively speaking, not an enormous amount of money, we could learn an awful lot of new things that we need to know about what works and what doesn't work. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank, uh, again, New America. I want to thank Riker, our guy who put this together. Um, my colleagues at the Washington Monthly, Alice and, 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 and Norman and everybody. And a big round of applause for a great panel.